So we continue learning about some of the really neat missionaries who are doing really neat work around the world and in the U.S. as well that we get to support and that we get to pray about and help make their ministries possible. And we're going to talk about three missionaries over the next three weeks. And they work in very different contexts and locations, but the work that they do I felt was connected by some common themes. So tonight, I want to talk about those three briefly as an overview and read some Bible verses that inspire each of them before we really get to know them in more detail over the next three uh, lessons. One common theme of each of these three uh, uh, missionary summer couples, uh, summer singles. They work in Uganda, in the, the Triangle area in North Carolina, and in Danville, Virginia. Those are the ones we're going to be talking about. And they are all there for the long term. They are in it for the long haul. They're not just there to give out something and then head back. They are in it. And we were talking about that last week as well, as a long term presence of over years of, of love and relationship, nurturing disciples through that long-term presence because they are committed to the people in those places. And a lot of the people that they minister to are forgotten by um, other folks who might live there. Um, the, these people, like we talked about a few weeks ago, kind of live on the margins and might have been forgotten about. So all the missionaries that we'll talk about over the next three weeks make it a point to invite folks who might have been forgotten. And hopefully they can inspire us to do the same kind of mission work here in our mission field in our community. And the, uh, the Bible verses that we'll talk about, it'll be the same each week, kind of like the last two weeks we read the Great Commission both times, uh, the last two uh, missionaries we met when we talked about Scarlet Jasper in Kentucky, and then back, it might have been before the New Year, um, Kirk and Susie in Thailand. Uh, we read the Great Commission for both of those. And this time, for the next three missionaries, we're going to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 22. And it's just kind of a reminder what the book of Ephesians is up to. Paul was writing this book to the new Christians in the city of Ephesus. They had been uh, Gentiles, so none of them were Jewish. Uh, the language of the time might refer to them as pagans. They were just kind of normal Greek people out there in the world, so not Jewish. So previously, they did not have a relationship with God, with God the Creator. They were unaware of God's love and forgiveness available to them and promise of new life for them. So these are new Christians. They have not been Jews before, didn't really have a relationship with God before, and Paul is writing this to them in Ephesus. So let me read the first two verses to get us started. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. So be listening for what you hear. Remember that at that time, previously, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. So what are these verses about? What did you hear these verses telling the Ephesians? What's Paul wanting them to learn and hear in these verses? What does Jesus do? Well, they go to know about Jesus mm -hmm. and about his coming and what he was there for. Mm -hmm. And it's it made a change in their life. So what's the change that he wants them to know from before and now? They didn't know him before and they will know him now. Yeah. Since they didn't know uh, God or Christ before, 
they didn't know about uh, the promises available to them, the abundant life on earth and in heaven. Uh, they didn't know that through grace we can have fellowship with God. They, they were outsiders in physically and spiritually because they didn't know they could be inside in relationship with God and they were considered outsiders amongst the Jewish faith. Like that, this goes back to that whole big thing where the, the Jews were very exclusive and you could only participate, be a part of the church, come to worship if you were Jewish and if you were male, you were circumcised and all the, all the laws, the Old Testament, all that stuff. So Paul is saying beforehand, previously, you were outsiders spiritually in your heart, but you were outsiders just physically because you wouldn't have been allowed into the, the church, into the fellowship with God. But through Jesus Christ, you are brought in both ways. Now you are spiritually in the family of God, and physically they're in the church. They are part of the body of Christ physically as well. All right, let's keep reading. Verses 14 through 18. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Okay, so what are those verses about? What does Paul want the Ephesians to hear in these verses? What does Jesus do? What he'll, difference? He'll set the Jews and Gentiles as one. Yes. Yes. They have been separate. They have been divided as two different kinds of people in the old worldly way of thinking. But now through Christ, they are one. Yeah. What else? What else did you hear? Effects that Jesus has. He's the access. We have to our heavenly Father mm -hmm. through Him. He's the one that does the bringing together, mm -hmm. and through Christ's work, we are no longer separated from God the Creator, and we're no longer separated from each other if we don't want to. What kind of uh, work does it describe Jesus as having in these verses? It's an interesting kind of language. Abolishing the law. Yeah. Abolishing the law, and that law was the big divider, the big excluder, the big barrier, these verses call it, that kept these Gentiles out of the family of God, because they wouldn't have been allowed in even if they had wanted to previously. So through Christ, those barriers are broken down, spiritually and physically. So Christ is the, the bringer together. What once had been divided is separate, now is joined in one body of Christ. So that's the peace of Christ. The peace when you realize that everyone has been brought together, reconciled together, and you realize that you're all part of the same body of Christ, part of the same spirit. That's uh, the reconciling action that Jesus does. Breaking down the barriers, the human barriers that separates. Humans are really good at separating and saying that's your side this is my side don't cross this line in the middle we did we did it as kids with our siblings in the car or in the house all the time and in the back seats rightly so because this was my side and but grown-ups do it too on a world stage that's your space this is my space you don't come over here that's your whatever country or this is my stuff you don't take my stuff. And it's a very, that, that kind of human, worldly, like we, we start off as kids thinking like that. And Jesus is trying to mature us and say, no, 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 don't, don't think in terms of divisions. And that belongs to them, that belongs to them, this belongs to you, so you better protect it. No, no, no. Jesus, right there, says, he's breaking down those barriers, breaking down that hostility and division. All right, let's keep reading. 
Let's read uh, verses 19 through 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Okay, what were those verses about? What does Paul want the Ephesians to learn about Jesus' impact? They were going to build a church, and Jesus is the cornerstone of the foundation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not only in the previous verses, Jesus is the bringer together, but now Jesus uh, is the, the foundation so that they can all be built up stronger than they would have otherwise because we're stronger together than we are separately. So Jesus bring them together and built on that foundation, then they will all be stronger. Some were on the outside, and it says that in verse 17, Jesus preached peace to you who are far away, like the Gentiles, kind of on the outside of the family of God, and peace to those who were near, so like Jews on the inside. So the Gentiles far away, the Jews who were near. So Jesus is preaching peace to both of those. And if they can allow themselves to come together, overcome those human distinctions and divisions and keep it out exclusion, then on the foundation of Christ, differences have been abolished. Now we can build together. Now we can get stronger than we would have been otherwise. So we're going to be reading some of those verses over the next uh, three sessions when we talk about these missionaries more specifically as a common theme of inspiration. And there's one more common theme that connects them all. And I mentioned this when I gave the announcement on Sunday. Since it was Martin Luther King Day on Monday, I wanted to bring in a quote from Martin Luther King. And in one of his, uh, in some of his speeches and writings, he talks about this idea of a beloved community. Anybody ever heard like that kind of phrase mentioned, a beloved community? It was like, it, it was kind of um, the, the dream that Martin Luther King had. That was kind of his title of, of what that community would be. So he dreamed of this community and he called it the beloved community. And he considered it a realistic goal that could be achieved one day if enough people committed themselves to the work of peace and the work of Christ that we read about in these verses of bringing people together and abolishing differences. So the beloved community was his vision for the world where everybody was an equal part in the body of Christ, which meant that um, nobody was better than anybody else. That meant if someone was lacking, they were helped so that everyone had enough of what they needed to survive. Things like poverty, hunger, homelessness wouldn't be tolerated in the beloved community because if everyone's equal, then the other members of the beloved community wouldn't tolerate any of their brothers and sisters having to suffer like that. So, of course, racism, all forms of discrimination, bigotry, prejudice, that kind of stuff would be replaced with a spirit of welcome, of brotherhood and sisterhood, of inclusion, not exclusion. And in Martin Luther King's beloved community, he recognized that there would be conflict because that's just a human thing. We're going to get in disagreements. That's, that happens. But when disputes would happen, whether they'd be big or small, they could always be resolved in a peaceful way. Reconciliation, resolution, without violence. And it's not about physical strength or power, but peace and coming together. So do you think, like Martin Luther King did, that kind of community is possible and achievable. Do you think that's realistic? 
Oh, really? We have to believe that. Oh, yeah? That's our only hope. <laughs> yeah. So one day, like, it may be on a, could be on a small scale or a large scale. On the earth, it's possible. You think it's possible? <laughs> there, there's less. I see one day. Yeah. I, I wish that I thought that, but uh -huh. I don't really think that. I used to, but not anymore. <laughs> Among the Christian community, yes. It, I'm not even sure about that. It is hard <laughs> when because you, there are so many differences, differences. in yeah. the Christian community. I mean, yeah. that's broad, so I'm not sure that that's possible. I would like for it to be. Yes. I think we need to work for peace, but uh, we need to be part of working for that. Right. Not making walls. There. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We need to work on the barriers. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I think it is possible. It is achievable. The more that people can follow the way of Christ that that builds this kind of community. But it's tough. It's not going to be easy or quick. And, of course, every time you turn the news on, you see examples of it not happening now in the world um, uh, maybe maybe if it can be achieved or built on small scales that can then inspire others and then kind of slowly grow maybe on a larger scale and, and that's what like y'all said that's where we come in that's our work is to demonstrate that kind of beloved community that is a, a Christian fellowship's part of its mission is to say, look at our community. Notice how it's different from the world, how we are inviting everyone together to, to be strengthened and grown on the foundation of Christ and the peace that uh, guides us all to, to come together and be joined in this way. Look how we are doing that. And how it blesses everyone involved. And notice how it's different. So that is part of the mission of Christian communities, of congregations, of local uh, manifestations of the body of Christ. If, if the beloved community can happen or start anywhere, it's going to start there. And we need to show what it can look like. Well, let me, like I said, show a little preview and I've got one video that's just, it's less than two minutes. And it gives a brief preview of some really amazing missionary work that's going on in Uganda, the Triangle area of North Carolina, and Danville, Virginia. And all the examples, they're trying to build beloved So be listening for how each of these three examples are trying to build beloved community in the mission fields where they are serving. I just 
consistently reaching out and love and walking alongside of refugee families that are in the United States or wherever. Christ would have us to be welcoming, to be community, because if people can't find the community inside the church, then I don't know where else they're going to go. This work of creating a loving community is work we must do together. It doesn't happen without you. Did you say that was Virginia? Yeah, Danville, Virginia. Danville, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some really neat work that they're doing there, which we'll get to um, in the next week or the week after. So what did you hear about the work that those three locations are doing? Um, there's uh, missionary couples and different uh, kind of partners who are at those three locations. So what did you hear they were doing and how to connect with some of the verses that we read already? It's like they're helping them to begin establishing roots by stopping the, the refugee highway. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that ministry is in the Triangle area and uh, other locations, the Welcome House Ministry ministers to refugees who have often had to travel and flee from one country to another to kind of get paperwork and approval and safe passage. And um, uh, so they're trying to make a place and help people land and set up connections, whether it be a friend, a church, new church family, job training, uh, language help figure out how do I live now that I am in the U.S. in the Triangle, um, and their their mission work, even though it's stateside, um, it's to internationals who desperately need to be connected to a community to start their new life here. So yeah, that's a good. I think Mark and Kim have been here. I, they uh, visited, uh, I chatted with them here, and did they speak here before I came, like years past? Okay, good, good. Um, they were passing through maybe two years ago because their, I think like their son maybe was working in Black Mountain, and they stopped here to check in with, uh, at the time it was just me and Jane, and um, I just wanted to say hello and see how things were going, just kind of, you know, remember us in prayer kind of thing. Uh, but they do really, really uh, neat work. And, and I got to, the, the way I know them is when I was pastoring in Lewisburg, north of Raleigh, we kind of set up a church partnership with a Congolese congregation. And I passed out a story about that um, a few weeks ago. And it was just a super cool experience. And that's how I got to know the work that Mark and Kim Wyatt are doing in the Research Triangle and beyond. They've expanded their Welcome House ministry. What else did you hear about? Uh, what kind of common threads did you hear? Some similarities or connections uh, to the Bible verses? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's a great analogy for what Paul is talking about with the Ephesian Christians, because Ephesus would have been a city of people from different backgrounds, and he's saying no matter what your background was, no matter where you're from, if you're a Jew or a Gentile, you are one in Christ now. So we all sit around the same table, and we all are loved the same, we're all forgiven, and we all have Christ as our foundation. And that's what those missionaries are trying to do. And uh, whether it's uh, tackling homelessness in Danville, Virginia, um, folks that are on their own, that don't have any support, don't have a community, don't have a church family, uh, maybe don't have a job, maybe don't have a secure place to eat or live, um, trying to say you belong here because you're welcome here because you're a child of God 
So no matter what you're like or what your background is, you are part of this body of Christ. And I think that the missionaries who are doing refugee work, it's an even stronger connection to these Ephesians verses, how Paul said that Jesus came and preached peace to you who are far away, peace to those who are near. And Paul talked about the, the divisions, the, the separateness, uh, that you had been foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. And I just imagine all those verses applying to a refugee family in such a beautiful way. It's like you could read those verses today to a refugee family as you welcome them into your church or something. And you could say, you know, Christ came to preach to those who are far away, whatever country you came from, to those who were close by, and whatever um, you know, separates us now, whether it's a language or culture or the differences or ethnicity or whatever it is, whatever had been separating us no longer does. Whatever had been dividing us we can let that go, and we can sit around the table, and we can be community together. So we'll read those verses again. Um, next week, we'll have the guest speaker from the North Carolina Baptist Foundation. But then after that, we'll be talking about the Grace and Maine Fellowship community in Danville, Virginia, and the Welcome House Network for Refugee Ministry in the Triangle area, and a a mission house in Uganda that helps refugees who have come to Uganda from other countries whose situation was so dire and whose life was under threat, they have come to Uganda. And so this uh, mission center helps them, uh, teaches kids who are of school age, gives them an education, does job training, uh, feeds houses if need be, and just all around, like we talked about last week, it's that big word support, which might not sound like much, but if you have fled your home country and you are now in another culture and have nothing and no, nobody, then to have a group, a place that says, you can come and be a part of us. What do you need? You need this, you need that. We're here to support you. That's everything. That is, real, that is real work that Paul talks about here, of inviting people in, bringing people in, fellow citizens now with God. No matter what country you had been from, now we're all citizens of God's kingdom. So we'll go ahead and uh, stop there. That's a good stopping point for tonight. And the next three times we'll watch more videos. We'll get to know the folks in Uganda and uh, Martin Kim Wyatt and uh, the folks in Danville as well. Let me say a prayer, and we will end our time tonight. Let's pray. Oh God, we confess that we are often so tempted to behave like we did when we were children and to say, that space is yours, this stuff is mine, and don't cross it. We confess that we are still tempted to think in those kind of immature, childish ways. So help to expand, help us expand our vision, oh God. Expand it all the way so that we can see what your kingdom looks like. So that we can start building a preview of your kingdom here, even if it's just in our church building, to have a wonderful example of beloved community. May we be inspired by the awesome work of missionaries who are in our extended church family. We pray your blessings on their work and that it might inspire us as well. To help everyone know that they are welcomed and loved at your table and in your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.